great to hear you all sing. I, I love singing with you. Uh, go ahead and have a seat, and we'll get started here in just a moment. I'm going to have to get a drink because I was singing way too loud over there. That was exciting. I, I love our worship team. Love being a part of singing every single week, even on the Vandalia campus. Love it. We are, uh, we're jumping into this message. By the way, I'm Tim. I'm the Vandalia campus pastor, one of the pastors on staff here at Metro Community Church. Love being on staff here. Love being one of your pastors. <laughs> we got at least one in the crowd. Um, <laughs> love being here, though, to, to share with you. We're going to be talking about renovation. Now, depending on your history with that word, you may have a positive view of it or a negative view of it. I know uh, for my wife and I, a couple years ago, we decided to do some major renovation projects in our house. Uh, she, she does a fantastic job. Like when she sees something on Pinterest or one of these, you know, HGTV shows where they're renovating a house or a space, she does a great job of just capturing it and she has her own thoughts and she can just kind of see a space and go, this is how it's supposed to look. Now it may take her a while to find the piece that's in her head to fit in that space, but she knows what she's looking for. And so we did a couple of rooms, and she, uh, she kind of knew what she was looking for, and we were walking through the renovation. We got our contractor. We were working through it. Everything was going great. I mean, it might have taken just a little bit longer than we thought, but whatever. Like, you, that's just part of the process. That's what you deal with. And we, we, one of the rooms that we did was our basement bathroom. Now, we had been having problems, and we thought we just needed to, like, switch some things out, and so that's what we did. The contractor did a great job, like, testing everything. We thought it was working great. Redid the floor, redid the walls, redid everything, and then still had the same issues, and uh, we had to bring in a plumber, and he let us know that our piping was completely shot, and we had to rip all that floor up and redo it all, right? And so then, in that moment in renovation, you're like, oh, no, this is going to take forever. It's going to cost more than we thought. Like, you're having all those thoughts, right? And that is true in our lives. Like, depending on what your history is with renovation, you either have a positive view where you're just like, oh, I love dreaming. I just love the possibilities. Like, I love looking for things. I love watching the shows. Like, one of my favorite shows right now, because I, I, I love dreaming. I'm a dreamer. I love thinking about the possibilities of things. And so one of my favorite shows right now is something about redoing the backyard. And I forget the name of it, but it's, it's, they redo backyards all over the place. And uh, they take these like green or brown spaces and they turn them into these beautiful backyards where I'm just like, oh, can we do that? And I don't really have a backyard, so no. But uh, it's just like that is a beautiful space, like so many ideas. Maybe you're like that with renovation where you get to dream. You get to have, think about the possibilities. You get to think about how you're going to take kind of a dull, dingy space and turn it into something brand new and bright and a place where people are like, oh, man, I love what you did here. And I just want to be in this room and just sit here and just soak it all in. But then there's other of us, other, others of us that have had a history with renovation where you're just like, man, it took forever. I never thought it was going to end. It was just another bill. It was just another thing. Like, I saw the thing on Pinterest or HT, HGTV where I was just like, that is what I want. And then what you saw in your house was like, this is not it. Like, that doesn't compare. It didn't turn out like I thought it was. It may have even been painting, right? You're like, oh, yeah, I can't screw up painting. And all of a sudden you do. Like, you're just like, this ho looks horrible. And you're just like, I, I hate renovation. Like, it's just a nightmare. It's constant pain all the time. Like, I, I just never have had a good experience with it. Well, neither, in, in either case, I need you to grasp something about renovation. Renovation happens all the time, and it is necessary every single day of our lives. It is critical for us to find new energy every single day of our lives. Let me, de let me give you a definition of Renovate. Maybe, I mean, it's a word we use quite often in our world, but maybe it's a word that you haven't quite identified or, or nailed down with the definition. So let me give it to you. It's to impart new vigor, to revive, or to restore freshness. So it's like this new energy, this new vigor, this, this excitement, this freshness. There's just something about it where you're just like, ah, oh, this feels right, this feels good, I just feel so good. Think about it. Renovation doesn't just happen in houses or in backyards, right? It happens even with us as people, right? Like, I can tell you one thing of renovation that happens, uh, to some of us at least, is exercise, right? When you exercise, that's what you're doing is you're renovating your body. I know for me, this is, you know, for me, running 
really does something to bring new energy out of, me, out of me. And some of you are like, Tim, you're talking about renovation and now running. I don't like where this is going. But uh, I do. There's something with exercising and running that is just exciting for me. It, it brings energy. A lot of my creative thoughts that I come up with when people are like, how did you think of that? I'm just like, I was running. That, like, that's what happened. But maybe it, your exercise is like lifting weights. Like, that's the thing that just brings new energy. Or going for a hike in nature or just walking. Maybe it's walking with somebody. Like, it just does something to you to bring some new energy and new vigor and freshness into your life, right? And I know your body thanks you as it kind of develops muscles and burns some calories and burns some energy. Like, it does something to renovate us. Another thing that I know we all do it at varying levels is sleep, right? When you put in a good, hard day's work and you're just like, you get to the end of that day, it doesn't matter if you were actually working or you were doing stuff around the house or you just running around with the kids or running around with your friends and all of a sudden you're just like, man, I, I've put in a full day. It's time to go to bed. Hopefully eight hours later, right? I say eight because if you do have kids, it's probably not eight. Like, it, it's probably less. But eight hours, hopefully eight hours later, you're waking up and you're like, oh, all right, I just feel good about the day. Like, I'm ready to go. I got this freshness. And some of us, it takes longer to wake up than others. But as you get there, you're just like, hey, I am so glad to just be awake and I've got new energy for a new day. That's renovation. It's physical renovation. Maybe it, it, another area of renovation that can happen is just relationships, right? Like, have you ever had that friend where you're just like, we haven't, we haven't caught up in a while. And like, let's do lunch this week. Can you do lunch? Like, get together and we'll just kind of dust off our friendship and just go, hey, what, catch up and find out what's going on. You're renovating that relationship with that person. I just, uh, I just got to spend uh, here uh, uh, yesterday, I just got to spend some time with a friend that I haven't seen in like 15 years. Uh, he came into town with his wife, and we got to catch up. We got to talk about old times. We got to kind of dust off the relationship and renew some of that that we had so many years ago. It was awesome. It was exciting. It brought new energy into the relationship. This can happen with uh, our kids and our parents, right? Sometimes you just got to dust those relationships off and go, hey, I, I haven't caught up with you in a while. Let me, let's talk. Let's find out what's, what's going on in your world. It can have, I, in fact, I, I had a friend, I, I was trying to look for him, he's a childhood friend of mine, and I had looked for him on all the social media platforms that I could think of, and I just couldn't find him, I was like, I, you know, maybe he just dropped off the face of the earth, and um, I went on this random social media app, okay, and I was just like, oh, I'll look for him here, found him on that app, random app. And I, was just, I reconnected with him, it was so exciting to hear what was going on in his life, getting to reconnect with that. We need this renovation in our marriages as well, right? Like uh, this weekend, my wife and I are celebrating our 17th wedding anniversary. We got, we got married 17 years ago. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I didn't, 17 years ago, I didn't watch her walk down the aisle, say I do, and then just go, well, okay, we're married, and uh, I guess we'll see where it goes from here and just leave it alone, right? No. I didn't put my wife on a shelf and just go, we'll catch up eventually, no, I, it's intentional. Like our kids are finally getting to an age where we can just go on a date and leave, like leave them. We don't have to worry about the babysitter side of things. Right? We're finally getting to that place. This last week, we took a trip up to New England. We got to get away. I have awesome in-laws that watched our children so that we could get away for a few days, spend some time in New England, and just freshen our relationship and our marriage and spend quality time together. And we literally did nothing but enjoy the beautiful place that it was, enjoy the shoreline, listen to the waves crash in, take a bunch of naps, and read books. Like, that's all we did. We, we were very boring, but it renewed our relationship. And we just enjoyed each other for a few days. And we need that in our marriages as well. We need it in our spiritual lives also. And I found this quote uh, about renovation, and I, I thought it was very fitting uh, for this message. So let me read this quote to you. It's, renovation can never be finished. And if you've had a bad experience with renovation, you're like, yes, it felt like it was never going to end. Like it was just going on and on and on. But renovation can never be finished it can only be stopped. Now, you may finish a project, like let's take the house. You may finish a project in your house and it may be done, but you have to keep renovating that house. You're eventually going to have to paint some walls. You're eventually going to have to fix something. You're eventually going to have to replace equipment because renovation can never be finished. If you stop renovation, everything falls apart. It gets old. It wears out. It's, it becomes a mess. That's true in our houses, backyards, relationships. 
And it's true of our relationship with God. I want to give this verse to you to just kind of encapsulate how Jesus views renovation in our lives, a godly spiritual renovation. It's Philippians 1.6. It says this, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, and that's Jesus Christ, that he, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, if you've handed your life over to Jesus and you said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, you can have my life. And in exchange, Jesus gives you his life that starts now and it gets to last forever as eternal life. He says, when I give you my life, I'm going to continue, continually conform that life in you to look more and more like me every single day. And so you are going to have to walk through daily godly renovation with me as I show you where you need to go with that life that I gave you. And it's going to have to happen over and over and over every single day. I expect it to happen continually until the day of Jesus Christ. What is that? What is the day of Jesus Christ? Well, it's either the day that he comes back to us or we leave this world, go on into eternity to go be with him. So when are you done? When you're dead. It's ongoing. It's supposed to happen every single day that he gives us here. It's critical to happen every single day. So if we're going to talk about renovation, if you're going to do some good renovation, you need some good tools, right? So I'm going to give you four tools for godly renovation, and these are necessary. These are necessary tools. You cannot see godly renovation every single day of your life if you don't use these tools in your life. Now, we're going to jump into the life of King Hezekiah. You may have heard of King Hezekiah. You may not have. Let me catch you up to speed of where we're at. He's the king of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, all right? What happened, I need to rewind. Let's rewind about 250 years. There's a guy on the throne of king. He's the king of Israel. His name's David, King David. He is the greatest king that Israel has ever had. He's viewed that way. He's viewed as a man after God's own heart. He pursued God with everything that he had. He made mistakes. He did things wrong, but he pursued God with, with everything that he had. And, and, and God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set your throne up to be established forever. And so basically, someone in his line will always be ready to rule over the nation of Israel. David has a son, his name's Solomon, King Solomon. He's viewed as the wisest man that ever lived, right? And so uh, King Solomon, he ends up building the temple where they all worship and they congregate and, and they come together as a community to worship God. It's where they give their sacrifices and, and to correct the relationship where, hey, we've sinned. We've been, a, you know, I, I, I've done some mistakes and I need to restore that relationship. And, and Solomon built that temple to give a location to go to at, uh, for the Israelites, for all the nation of Israel. Then Solomon's son wasn't as wise as his dad, and he made some critical errors, and the kingdom actually split. And so there were 10 tribes of Israel that were called the northern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel, and then two tribes that were the kingdom of Judah, all right, or the southern kingdom. And now let's fast forward again, 250 years, and we get to King Hezekiah. He is part of the kingdom of Judah, so he follows that line of King David all the way through. He's taking the throne, but here's what's happening. The Assyrian Empire is the, is the empire of the world. They have basically all but conquered the northern kingdom. They are taking over country after country. Uh, they're leaving things in shambles. The northern kingdom is, is like it's basically non-existent. And the Assyrian Empire is knocking on the door of the kingdom of Judah, ready to take them next. And there's a lot of uh, upheaval. The people are overwhelmed. And they're coming off of a king that did absolute wickedness in the eyes of God. He did not care about obeying God at all. That's King Hezekiah's dad. And then we enter into King Hezekiah's reign. Let's look at this. And, and as we get into the King Hezekiah, let's, let's give you the first tool. The first tool that we need that is necessary for godly renovation is godly resoluteness. Godly resoluteness. Now, we don't use that word, we don't use the word resolute a lot anymore. We just don't. But the, the idea behind resoluteness is to be firm, determined, and unwavering. It's like you set the course, you know the course is right, and you're like, we're headed this way. I'm going to be resolute. I'm going this way. You can follow me. You don't have to follow me, but I'm not changing course. It's unwavering. It's firm. I'm determined. We're heading this way, 
All right? So that's the idea behind resoluteness. So let's see what King Hezekiah does to show this resoluteness. 2 Chronicles 29 says this, Hezekiah was 25 years old. Now, I want you to capture that. He's 25. All right? Can you imagine if you, if you haven't seen the age 25 yet? Think back to when you were 25. Right? Nation's an upheaval. You finally take the throne. Maybe you've been dreaming about being the king of the nation for a while. You take the throne as a 25-year-old, and everything is in disarray, falling apart all around you, and you're like, oh, good, this is what I get? Awesome. Thanks, Dad. Right? That's, that's what's happening. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. So we know he's going to have a long reign just from the first verse about him. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now, David wasn't his father, right? But what it's doing here in saying the word father is giving position, going all the way back to the beginning. David was the beginning of this line, and Hezekiah has the same heart that pursues after God that David did. He's fiercely, firmly, resolutely pursuing after God. And I want you to catch this. As a 25-year-old, he wasn't waiting for dad to be okay with it. He just did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Right? I mean, think about it. His dad, uh, if you just go to the couple chapters before this and read about his dad, his dad was so wicked that like God even said, hey, I'm bringing correction through the Assyrian Empire, and it's coming for you if you don't correct what you're doing and obey me. And his dad basically said, Psh, you think I was doing wickedness before? Watch what I can do now. And like he went, he doubled down on wickedness. He doubled down on sin. He doubled down on uh, disobedience. And all the while where Hezekiah has a heart that says, I'm going to serve the Lord. I mean, we, we don't see this from the text. But it pretty much is like Hezekiah's dad is viewing his son, Hezekiah, as a disappointment because he wants to follow God, right? <laughs> he just chose to follow after God. He wanted to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In the first month of the first year, so first month of the first year, Hezekiah didn't wait. First month, first year of my reign, we're going. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Now, if you're going to pursue after God, he's been doing that his, through his life. He's, he's done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and now he's king. And we're, we'll actually find out a little bit later. This is the first day he's king. He's like, this is what we're doing. We're going to pursue after and do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. And if we're going to do that, we need a play, place to gather and worship together, uh, and, and that's the temple. But my dad did not take care of it. He didn't renovate it unless he, and, uh, in fact, he absolutely let it go uh, and be destroyed. Like, it, it's a shell of itself. It's dirty. It's dingy. It's messed up. Uh, it's got, it's just not pure. It's, it's an unclean place. And so he said, if, if I'm going to pursue and do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, I need to be able to worship here. And if I'm going to include others, I need to be, we need to be able to worship here. And so I got to get this cleaned up. So he did not wait for somebody else to jump in. He just said, I'm going to resolutely pursue after what is right in the eyes of the Lord. There's another passage I want to show you. It's in Colossians 3. And if you read through Colossians 3, you would almost think that whoever wrote this letter, and it's the, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter of Colossians to the church of Colossae. He's trying to encourage them. And, and you would almost assume that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter thinking about Hezekiah's life. Because when you put the renovation that Hezekiah walks through and the renovation that uh, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about within our lives, they go hand in hand, and they follow the same pattern in these passages. So if you think that godly renovation just kind of magically, you know, happens, it doesn't. There's a very, very specific pattern that takes place in the life of Hezekiah and even in the Apostle Paul's challenge to the church of Colossae. So let's look at what the Apostle Paul has to say in Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See here, the Apostle Paul is letting him know, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on doing right in the eyes of the Lord. Don't get distracted by earthly things. See, Hezekiah didn't let himself get distracted, and neither should we. Now, don't get me wrong. We need some earthly things, right? We need to make some money. We need some clothes. We need some food. We need some shelter. We need some things. There's very few things that we need, though. 
We are blessed way beyond what we need. I have been blessed incredibly beyond what I need. God's provided those earthly things. Am I willing to set my affection on Him and have a resolute, determined pursuit that's unwavering to follow what's right in the eyes of Jesus and what He wants to renovate in me today? We have got to have this godly resoluteness if we are going to let Him renovate us each and every day and bring out of us His life because it is His life. Did you catch that? For, or when Christ, who is your life, appears. See, if we've given our life to Jesus, it died. It died. And the life that is lived in us now is His. Will we let Him live the life that He wants to live through us? That's going to take renovation because I can tell you, I ain't perfect yet. He's got to do some stuff in me. He's got to do some stuff in you. Let's go to the second tool. So our second tool is spiritual companions with a sense of urgency. Spiritual companions with a sense of urgency. Now, was Hezekiah willing to do it by himself? Sure. He had resoluteness. I'm going this way. I don't really care. I've been doing it for a while. My dad hated that I was willing to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord when he was doing all the wickedness. I don't care. That's where I'm going. But, man, I would love some other people joining me right? And I think that's true for all of us. When we've got a few people that we know are in our corner, it's easier to run that race. It's easier to let some things happen to us. It's easier to catch things that we can't catch by ourselves. And so we need some spiritual companions. We see this in 2 Chronicles 29. He brought in the priests and the Levites. Now, I want you to catch this. The ruler of the kingdom brought in the spiritual leaders of the kingdom, and they joined forces to do this as spiritual companions. And you may be thinking, Tim, I'm not, I'm not the ruler of a nation. I'm not, I'm not even the ruler of this community. And you may not even view yourself as a spiritual leader, but let me tell you something. If you handed your life over to Jesus, you are a spiritual leader. Jesus expects you to take what he's done with you, the story that he's given you, what he's done in your life, and to tell other people about it. That's why it's called good news. Let me tell you, it was bad, and then Jesus came, and now it's good. That's the gospel, good news. It's because of what he's done. And we are spiritual leaders, and we need to gather together as spiritual companions. He assembled them in the square on the east side and said, Listen to me, Levites. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. That, that word consecration, if you've been around Metro for a little bit, about two months ago, Pastor Seth did a deep dive on this word, consecration. I would challenge you, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on this because you can go back and you can catch that deep dive and he did a fantastic job. Go back and catch it. I think it was April 10th. Go check it out. And, uh, let me, but let me give you the definition because we do need the definition of it. And it's to purify or dedicate for a sacred purpose. And here Hezekiah is challenging these Levites and he's saying, dedicate yourself for a very specific purpose. What's that purpose? to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. We're going this way. We're going to obey God. We're going to collectively, and as a result, we're going to hope the entire nation follows us. So he calls them in, spiritual companions, and notice this, consecrate yourselves now. We don't have time to wait. The Assyrian Empire is on our doorsteps. God said he's going to use them as correction in our lives. You might think that's harsh, but I mean, any good parent knows that when your child is doing something wrong, you need to correct them. It could be as harmless as they're going to touch the stove and you like have to, I mean, if you're trying to just jump and do it, like if it's urgent, you may have to smack their hand away. Is it because you're trying to hurt them? No, but you're trying to keep them from further hurt. And God was doing this in the kingdom of Judah as well. He's like, you're disobeying me and I'm going to have to bring correction to get things right. And Hezekiah's like, you don't need to. We want to pursue after you. But we need some spiritual companions in our life that can help us sense that urgency. We need community. We just did a deep dive on that a couple weeks ago. We need spiritual community in our lives that people that can come alongside of us and challenge us to keep going, to keep pursuing after God, to keep letting Jesus Christ do what he needs to do in our lives so that he, he, when people see us, it's very evident that he's doing something in our lives. I have a small group out in Vandalia, um, and I got to tell you, there's some men in, in that small group that I need in my life. And it's been very sweet here over the last uh, semester or two 
where God's just been doing something, where we've been texting each other, and we've been challenging each other, and there's a sense of urgency, like, I want to get it right now. Like, what do I need to do? We're, we're sharing, we're being very vulnerable with one another to get some stuff corrected in our lives. And it's, I, I look forward to it every single week because I'm just like, I need this. I need this new life that's breathed into me because of these spiritual companions that God has given me. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that needs that. I know they did. I'm pretty sure there's more than just a, the few of us. And so we need spiritual companions with that sense of urgency. So let's move on to the third tool. This is going to be a fun tool if you do renovation. If you, this is probably the fun side of it. Uh, the third tool is remove the old. Remove the old. So this is demolition day, right? This is where you get to rip everything out. This is where, you know, all the charges are in the stadium, and we get to blow it up to build that new stadium, right? Like that's, you get to have the fun. Like if you're demo day, you love doing that. You're just like, maybe you're running through walls and stuff. You're just like, let's tear it all down. Like it doesn't matter if you mess it up. It's all messed up. Like let's tear it down, right? Demo day can be a lot of fun. We need this tool. We need to let some demolition happen in our lives. And Hezekiah knew that it needed to happen in the nation of Israel too. 2 Chronicles 29 says this, Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. When they had assembled their fellow Levites and consecrated themselves, they went in to purify the temple of the Lord. As the king had ordered, following the word of the Lord, the priests went into the sanctuary of the Lord to purify it. They brought out to the courtyard of the Lord's temple everything unclean that they found in the temple of the Lord. The Levites took it and carried it out to the Kidron Valley. It was demolition day. We got some stuff to clean up here. And they got after it. Notice that Hezekiah didn't mince words. Our parents, they sinned. They were unfaithful. We're going to do something different. Let's get this place cleaned up. Some of us need to be cycle breakers in our family where we're going to be like, I'm doing what's right. It's not always popular in my family. I'm still going to do it. I'm doing what's right. I'm going to be resolute. I want you to capture the Kidron Valley, though. I almost didn't even look up this location. I'm so glad that I did. Uh, because the Kidron Valley was a very critical part of the city of Jerusalem. That's where they're at. And when you go out, this is, the Kidron Valley is right outside the city walls. And there's two specific uses of the Kidron Valley. One was militaristic. It was an escape route. Okay, so it was like a valley and a hill where there was a lot of rubble everywhere, all right? It was a place where they just threw a lot of rubble and stone, and, and they threw it out there. And so if they were being attacked, they were very rarely attacked here because it was hard for the armies to get footing because of all the rubble that was out there. But it was a great place to escape because if you're trying to get out and go down the hill, you could just slide down the hill. <laughs> like you can just get, let's get out of here. And they could leave. And so you could escape quicker than you could attack it. So it was one of milita military uh, view, but it was also a cemetery. It was also a place where they put loved ones, where they had to bury some things. I think it's very fitting that they took some unclean, unnecessary, unnecessary things and threw it in the cemetery to let it die. Let's look at Colossians 3. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. You used to walk in these ways. I can tell you, I'm with you. I used to walk in these ways. I loved those things at one point. I, my affection was set on those earthly things. You used to walk in these things in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Some of us need to have a Kidron Valley moment and take some things to the cemetery and let them die. We've had some old clothes on for too long. And we need them to come off. We need to let them die. As I was preparing for this message, I had, I, I had something going on with me. I don't know exactly what it was, but I had close friends that were noticing it. And they're just like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't think I am, but I can't figure this out. And, and I, I had one friend that I've just been very vulnerable with. I've been very transparent. I've let him get to know me really, really well. I've, been, uh, I've let him know some of the darker sides of my life. 
And, and he, he just stepped in. He's like, do you think it's, you know, I, you've talked about this thing. Do you think it's this playing out this way? And in that moment, God was just like, yep, it's that. And I needed that spiritual companion. Now, I was re- resolutely following after God. Like, I was determined, unwavering. I'm following Jesus. Jesus, do whatever you want with my life. But I needed that spiritual companion to catch the old self that kept showing up. And I had to spend the last few days burying something in the cemetery. Because it needed to die. And I'd been wearing it for far too many decades. And it needed to be taken off. And I'm not the only one. There's others of us that are listening to this that have some old junk, some old clothes that we need to bury because we have a new life. And with that new life that Jesus gives, he wants to keep doing something brand new in us every single day. He wants to do some godly renovation and renovation that doesn't stop, not till we're dead. That's Jesus' view on it. And in saying all that, let's get to the fourth tool. Because if we're going to have demo day and you're going to rip some stuff down and you're going to take some old clothes off and you're going to bury some things, I hope there's another side to it, but there is. And number four, our fourth tool is put on the new. It can be so easy to put off something but forget to put on something, right? Like we, we oftentimes are like, okay, I'm going to put on exercising, but we don't put off eating a ton, right? Like I struggle with that one. Right? You have to, it's a balance of doing both. Like we may be like, oh, I really want to do this activity. I'm going to add it to my schedule. And then we were like, oh man, my schedule's too full now. And we forgot. You, that means something probably needs to come off. Like there's a balance with this. And if we're going to have this godly renovation in our life, this, we're going to have a demo day. We need to add in some new. Let's fill those spaces that we torn down with something clean and fresh and vigorous and energetic for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we see this with Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. And he's done that with us too. He's chosen us to stand before him, to be advocates for other people around us. He's chosen us to lead people. He's chosen us to stand before people and go, this is what Jesus has done in my life. Here's my story with him. This is how he's changed it. I I had some old stuff. He's given me something new. They began the consecration on the first day of the first month. First day of the first month. Hezekiah did not mess around. He did not wait. He was like, I'm king now. We're going. First day, let's do it. And by the eighth day of the month, they reached the portico of the Lord. Eight days. I don't know if you view that as a lot or not, but eight days to reach the front porch, basically, that's a lot. That should tell you how just unclean and broken down this place was that they allowed it to get to this place and some major renovation had to happen because it took eight days just to get to the front door. For eight more days, they consecrated the temple of the Lord itself, finishing on the 16th day of the first month. So it took them 16 days to purify it. Then they went into King Hezekiah and reported, We have purified the temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the table for setting out the consecrated bread with all its articles. We have prepared and consecrated all the articles that King Ahaz, and Ahaz is Hezekiah's dad, that King Ahaz removed in his unfaithfulness while he was king. They are now in front of the Lord's altar. We got rid of the trash, and we brought in some stuff that King Ahaz removed. So we didn't just get rid of the old, we brought in the necessary new. It took us 16 days. Something that we've got to grasp, if we're putting off old and putting on new, and we're letting Jesus do what he needs to do with us with godly renovation, we've got to catch this. It takes time. I don't know if you view 16 days as forever to do that, or a small amount of time, but in either case, it doesn't just happen because you want to today. It takes time. Are we willing to show up every single day and let him just work on us? every single day. He's not in a hurry. He's like, I got until you're dead. Like, I got time. Like, we'll just keep doing this every day. We just have to keep showing up every day and let him do it. Colossians 3.10 shows this. And I've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, which is Jesus Christ. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against 
someone. For as the Lord forgave you, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I told you that my wife and I went to uh, New England, and we spent a lot of time in Maine just to work on us, like just to spend time together and just to have some fun together as a married couple. And as we were there, uh, we, we took very few items. We were trying to just, you know, take as little as possible. We were just going to get away for a few days. I mean, it was a couple days. We don't need a lot of things, and we're just going to be back. And then those couple days turned into a canceled flight, and it turned into a lot more days. All right? We weren't ready for that. And I actually started joking with my wife where I'm like, it was also colder than we thought it was going to be. It's still gorgeous and beautiful, but it, it was raining and stuff. And so it, it turned out to be a little bit colder than we thought. And so I only packed, like we, we were being, trying to be very, very minimalistic. I only packed one sweatshirt and one pair of sweatpants. And so if you see any pictures on my social media, you'll be like, I think he wore the same thing every day. And pretty much I did. Like I started joking with my wife where I'm like, there's probably people walking around, like, there's the guy and his stuff again. Like it's... There he is. Like everybody knew me because of what I had on. It was like, yeah, I saw him again. Did you guys see him? Yeah, he's over there. Like it, it was happening over and over because I, I just had to keep wearing it. I finally got to a place where I'm like, I don't know if I need souvenirs, but man, I really need to purchase some new clothes because this is getting to be a lot. Uh, and like we didn't know where the laundry places were. Like it was, it was just like, we've got to figure this out. And so I bought some new clothes and I put them on. You'll probably see when that, if you look at the pictures, you'll know when that happens. Because I wanted to wear something new. But that's true in our lives, right? Sometimes we've worn those old clothes. We like them. I liked those clothes. That's why I took them. They're like my ultra comfortable clothes. I love them. I love wearing the clothes that I had on, but they eventually got to a place where they started getting smelly and old. And I was just like, ugh, like I don't, I need to change. And some of us have been wearing some old clothes, some unclean clothes, spiritual clothes that need to come off. We've been wearing for far too long. And we need to put on something new. But I want you to grasp this. When you go in, I want to give you this illustration. When you go in to do this with Jesus, think of your favorite place to shop for clothes, right? You just know what they have. It just fits my body right. It's always in style. People always compliment me. I just love going to this place and purchasing clothes, whatever that place would be. And I want you to imagine yourself walking into that department store or that shop that sells those clothes that is just perfect for you. And you, ha you have old clothes on. They're being ripped. They're being torn apart. They're smelly. And you're just like, I need some new clothes. And you walk over and you pick something off the rack. That you're like, oh, I would love to wear this. And you look at the tag for the price, right? And you see that it says free. And you're like, well, this can't be right. Free? That can't be right. These are, not, these are too, too nice. Like they, they fit me too. They can't be free. And you go to the cashier and he says, yeah, yeah, that's been paid in full by Jesus every single piece of new clothing you want to put on, he's paid for with his blood. He paid for it on the cross. He shed his blood to give you new life every single day. He rose the third day to have victory over death so you can have new life every single day. You can have anything in the store. It's yours. Whatever clothes you want to put on. You can come back tomorrow and do the same thing again. Just keep exchanging your old clothes for new clothes every single day. We need to capture this as followers of Jesus. We need to understand that every day it's time to change clothes. He has something new for us. Every single day until we get to the point of completion, which is the day we go to meet him in eternity. And just to switch up that quote I gave you a little bit, because I think it's a fascinating quote, but I needed to change it a little bit to fit and make sense, especially as a believer in Jesus and a follower of Jesus. Godly renovation can never be finished. It can never be finished. It can only be completed by Jesus Christ. Will you let him complete it in you? Will you show up every single day to let him lay out that outfit for you? You go, here's a new one for you, and you get to put that on? Or are you going to carry around those old clothes that are ripped, tattered? They're, they're not doing you any favors. Are you going to leave them behind and put on something new? We need these four tools to see godly renovation in our life over and over again. And we need some people jumping in with us 
so we can pursue resolutely after God. And we know we got some people in our corner that's like, let's go. We've got this. I want the same thing you do. We're going to fail. We're going to mess up. We're going to hold on to old clothes too much. But that's why we're together. We're going we're gonna to let each other see this. And we're going to keep pursuing after Jesus every single day until he completes us. And we get to go be with him. And we get to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We were faithful with little. And he just kept giving us more. Let's be people that pursue after Jesus. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for giving your life. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve the new clothes. And you love us so much, you give it anyway. You desperately want us to find new life in you every single day. And so, Lord, I pray for those that are just struggling that are just like, I know I got some old clothes, but I don't, I, I just, I don't know if I want to take them off. But I pray that they would leave those spiritual old self behind. It would be former, not current. And we'd be willing to put on something new. But I pray for those that have not handed their life over to you yet, that they would fully hand their life over and just say, all right, I'm in with you, Jesus. I'm going to be resolute about this. I'm going to pursue after you with everything I've got. I'm going to find my people. I'm going to find my posse to jump in with me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for giving your life and continually giving it every single day so that we can find new life and renovation with you. I pray this in your name. Amen.